So um, I'm going to go ahead and do a brief introduction of each of them. Um, as, Danielle has, as Danielle covered earlier in the introduction of Kirka, we currently have um, five tribal partners. And um, when I sent out the slides for the speakers with the deadline, I just want to say like with the progress reports and following the directions, these were the five individuals that submitted their slides as speakers on time. <laughs> I can't really say that about the majority of the rest of the speakers on our agenda. And I have all the multiple emails I sent them. But I really appreciate the relationship that I built with them because I do feel like that is a mutual sign of respect that we've gathered. And um, as well as that, on top of that, with our progress reports, um, we have a very complicated, long, crazy progress report system now. And again, they were the only ones that followed the rules and stayed to the two-page limit. So, um, so that was really helpful. Um, and so we do have uh, Liz who added a lot of slides, but she guarantees me she's going to get it through in minutes. Um, and they all just checked her on it here. So um, <laughs> it's been really a pleasure to work with our tribal partners in the last um, year and a half that I've been with Kirka. I have a monthly phone call with them. It really gives us an opportunity to just kind of see how things are going, talk about where the project there is at, where we can make improvements with Kirka. I think that's one of the, the things as an evaluator um, and the type of evaluation that I do is a developmental evaluation. And so what has allowed that to be successful in us doing program changes is the feedback from our tribal partners on how we can work more efficiently with them. Um, and so to get started, um, we have Cody Bassett, who is a descendant of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa um, and a University of Minnesota Duluth alum. As an undergraduate, he was active in the community outreach and conducted research with faculty and peers. Upon graduating in 2012, Mr. Bassett's first research experience with the Fond du Lac Human Services Division was a, as a summer intern where he assisted in a chronic pain rehabilitation program. He joined Kirka in 2013, shortly after the tribe came on as a tribal partner, along with Nathan. Nathan, who's back here, is Cody's uh, uh, sidekick. Um, and so they, they've worked, they, they're both research specialists with, with um, their Health and Human Service Department. Um, Cody is also currently the chair of their IRB and has other multiple duties um, as well. Elizabeth Belt um, is an enrolled member of the Ogallala Sioux Tribe. Liz has been our longest um, current partner here. Um, and she's helping to open up new doors for the Ogallala Sioux Tribe in research. She joined in October of 2013 um, and is also the research review coordinator. Um, she's currently been working in the last year at really looking at improving their processes and she'll um, talk more about that. Recently in the last year, Don Ego joined us um, from the Sisseton Wapatin Oyate. Um, she's also a member of the Enemy, Enemy Swim District. Um, Don was a former tribal council representative and then joined Kirka earlier this year. And then we also have Anita Frederick, who is the executive director of the Tribal Nations Research Group. Anita, um, through Kirka and other partnerships, when Anita was initially hired by the tribe um, as to partner with us with Kirka, she really led the way with her community to develop the Tribal Nations Research Group um, and uh, has done great things there. So she'll share more with us about that. And then we have Bonita Morin, who's an enrolled member of the Spirit Lake Tribe. Um, and Bonita also joined us recently um, as the tribal liaison there with Chandeshka. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Cody get started. And if you could hold your questions till the end, please write <laughs> notes in your notebook somewhere. And then we'll take questions at the end. Well, thank you for that, Emily. Uh, I also uh, didn't do something right. Okay. Uh, oh, my colors are awesome. Um, thanks for that introduction. Uh, it means a lot to be able to work with Kirka and also to be able to work with uh, my tribe. I've spent a lot of time there. And it's just a, such a pleasure and an honor to be able to do something that benefits the community that I've put so much, spent so much time in. So, but anyways, here we are with Fond du Lac Human Services Division. Uh, 
two things I kind of tried to highlight were the Institutional Review Board. Um, when we first came on, it was kind of in shambles. It is something that had just kind of fallen by the wayside. And we had had one since 1995, and that kind of just grew out of necessity uh, with all the uh, bad research or bad research relationships that we're developing. We all know about those. Uh, <laughs> But it kind of grew out of necessity because the universities near us were starting to do research in our backyard, and well, they still were. And we've always had good relationships, but things were just becoming a concern. So we developed this so we could have our hands in that as well and become more active with the research that was taking place in the community. So in 2014, uh, when we came on, in one year, we had a nice turnaround, and I'm really biased about this because I, I worked, I feel I worked really hard on it. In January, we started working on new policies and procedures, and it started as this short little document that was only probably 10 pages long, and at a certain point, it all just got thrown out and rewritten, and now it's a 20-some pages, I believe, um, and it's going to get bigger, too. I'm already thinking about rewrites. But um, policies and procedures were approved in July, and then we had our membership selection, and ever since December, we've been having meetings. We haven't had that many meetings quite yet. It's still an evolving process, but uh, it's overwhelming how positive it has been so far <laughs> to see everybody in the Human Services Division who is on our IRB take such a, they care so much, and they, they take such responsibility in the entire review. Maybe a little too much, too. <laughs> Anyways, the big other item going on right now, and any chance I can get to talk about this, I will. Don't find me in my free time and ask me about it. You'll never get me to stop. Um, the opiate crisis uh, on the national level is huge. It's a big epidemic. It's affecting everybody. Uh, Minnesota, my state, is low on the national spectrum. However, certain areas are disproportionately affected. Um, and it's the leading cause of accidental deaths in the United States. Uh, we are the biggest uh, buyer of pills in the world at this point, pretty much. Not per capita, but supply-wise. Uh, anyways, so the concern started for this in our community couple of years ago, back in the early 2000s. Uh, overdoses were a big concern, and then recently there were concerns about the maternal population, uh, all of our mothers in the community. Um, I think Ascension and Duluth recently, we had a big, uh, they had a big five, six hour presentation uh, last fall where Duluth, the Ascension Health System said 10 per, uh, what was it, 2012, just under 9% of their births over the year were neonatal abstinence syndrome births, so babies who were exposed to substances in utero. And we had been aware of this for a while in our community, the Fond du Lac community, but now uh, we came on board and our first priority was trying to figure out how to assess this. And we, we have a study right now that's long in development, but at a certain point, we needed something expedited and fast because that one was just taking too long there, and uh, we wanted to get it right, but another one that we could get out of the way was the opioid use and treatment history interview, uh, which was a real intensive development. It was very quick, and the purpose was to learn more about opioid use in the community and identify possible patterns and behaviors and uh, kind of something to show people that, yes, this is happening, and uh, this is what we found out. But we collected all this data throughout all of January, and you can see a lot of this information in the poster session, which I really do encourage you, because it's, like I said, I could go on forever, not just about national statistics, but local statistics as well, and it's scary. Uh, we had community experts, you know, thankfully we have a strong bond in our communities. So our community experts were extremely valuable. Everybody knows one another, and they were great at finding people who could participate. And we identified 62 participants throughout the month of January who were current or former users. Uh, 
or suspected users, I guess would be the term, uh, who were asked to participate, and they did. Uh, 56 item inventory, lots of uh, questions about prescription drugs and methadone specifically, because um, we really wanted to investigate the methadone. Anyways, uh, I would tell you more, but once I start, I won't stop. <laughs> And I feel like I might be on my eight minutes anyways. So uh, future goals, just to kind of a brief highlight, they're very kind of generic. Uh, complete the current projects that we have in development right now. We just got a new uh, diabetic neuropathy study going, hopefully to see some pain relief with a, with a new device. Uh, and then start planning our follow-ups and uh, keep the ball rolling. And uh, I keep saying we need to get more momentum, but we've got a lot of momentum, especially for two people. And I should say Nathan isn't really a sidekick. He's a, <laughs> it sounds like Batman and Robin and <laughs> it's not the case. Uh, and uh, the big thing is we, every two years we have a biennial needs assessment. So we've got to get going on that and that'll take quite a few months to plan as well. So thank you. I'm Liz and I'm from OST. I wear many hats at OST. I'm the tribal liaison for CRICA. I'm the health research coordinator for health administration and I'm the research review board coordinator, probably the role most of you are familiar with. Um, I just want to throw some statistics about our tribe. We're the eighth largest reservation. Obviously we're in the southwest corner and we have about 56,000 enrolled members. Some of the highlights that I'm going to talk about is the um, new online OSCRB submissions website, our community research conference, and the start of our research agenda. Um, OSC now does electronic submission. I know most of you are familiar <coughs> with our research review board. We, the website currently hosts all of our most up-to-date forms, and I believe we are the first tribal nations to use electronic submission. Some of the things that you can submit on the OSTRB submissions website are initial review, amendments, the annual continuation review, final report, data return report, and your publications. This is some of the things that we had a lot of questions on. I know a lot of you in here are PIs that come through our review board, so I just wanted to throw this out there. That our institution ID is Oglala. That's probably the most emails I get on a daily basis is what's the institution ID? Even our own RB members right? <laughs> ask me what our institution ID is. Um, the initial um, email that goes out to create your logon information has a 24-hour expiration date. So, And it is okay to add your own research coordinator. So you don't have to be the one that's uploading your information. You can designate somebody else to do it. Um. So in May, we hosted the No Longer Dreaming, Your Own Native American Research, and it was at the Boys and Girls Club in Pine Ridge. We had around 70 attendees and 52 of them were tribal members. We had our conference assistant, Lyndon Brown, and he done wonders for us. And we had a really active working group. Um, we wanted our community conference to be, to get our research aspect out there to our tribe. So I think we did a pretty good job or we're doing a pretty good job. Earlier I was telling the tribal partners that I was driving somewhere on the radio one day and I heard our tribal president say, hey, don't we have a research review board? And so I was like, yes, so <laughs> we're getting out there. Um, some of the um, people that we reached out to in our community was OLC. And their KLLC people actually recorded our conference, so we should be getting some footage back from that. We did some PSAs on the local radio station, and I would have loved to do more community involvement. So I think if there's anything that I learned, it's to involve more tribal programs so that we have more um, community involvement. OLC would have been one of my number one people that I would have partnered with. Mm -hmm. So our research agenda, this is where most of my slides come in. Um, when we did our conference, we had people ask 
where is this information at? Is it available? Is it out there? And as most of you know, our website is not up or we don't have one. So I put them in here so it is available. Um, when we start building our research agenda, we started with the electronic library and <clears throat> that was the building of our catalog. So we were able to search by keyword to tell you how many studies we had, the number of studies, what institutions submitted. We done some surveys asking our community members what their number one health disparities were. We did some talking groups. We started the talking group um, aspect, but we didn't engage as much as we wanted to. I know most of you are familiar that our reservation had a pretty high spike in suicides at the beginning of or the last couple months, so we kind of put that on hold. Then we did some community engagement at our power. Um, so this is just one of the charts from the research catalog, and as it shows, cardiovascular health was one of the top things that were researched on our reservation. Um, 2010 was the year that we had the most submissions. When we did our surveys, um, this is what the RU said, that alcohol and drinking were their top health disparity with diabetes then suicide. With our adults, it was diabetes, then alcohol, drinking, and cancer. And our elders, it was diabetes, cancer, and heart disease. Some of the things that were brought up in talking groups that our people would like to see researched was obesity, cancer. These are no um, specific order. This is just some of the topics that were brought up. And then our community engagement, we. Um, we have a big health fair during our power and we have, that's when we get the most um, community members together at one time. So we did, me and Victoria had a booth last year. And we set out a piece of paper and we throw stuff from the research catalog and had people put um, stickers on there naming what you think is the top health disparity. So this is what they said. So top three and four, I think we did four. So these are the top three. So like top three is the top three, top three, top four. And some of the things that we're planning on doing is just to continue and work on our electronic library. So we have the catalog um, with just the titles and stuff like that information, our basic information. Now we're going to go back through and upload all the rest of the documents for each project. So eventually we can see what was missing, what was turned in, if there was data turned in, where is it? Because that's one of the things that we're working on too. Chad's been a big help in helping us come up with the data return form that we're currently using and it's been awesome. So we're finally getting data back and just continuing with building the research agenda so that we can make more partners and help our people, you know, because eventually everybody's dream is to have your people be the researcher, not being the researchee. Mm -hmm. And then we've also started building um, our own, I don't know if it's a website or web page, but we'll be searchable through Google after this, hopefully. Mm -hmm. well, that's it. See, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dawn Eagle, and I am the research specialist at the Sisito Wakpeto Yate. I started working in January, so I'm fairly new compared to all these experienced individuals. I feel like a little rookie, um, but they've also been very helpful because we've had a lot of meetings either through the telephone or passing information through email. So they've been very, very helpful. So I'm really appreciative of, of the other travel partners. I'm also appreciative of the Kirka people who've been instrumental in helping our tribe develop the necessary infrastructure with regard to research. 
I myself got started in the research area back in 1990 when I first went to school. And <clears throat> I was always a proponent of education and gaining knowledge. And so I've been able to use my education to come back home and work with my people and being able to look at our young people and say, well, you know, there's going to be a future scientist, there's going to be a future researcher, there's somebody that's going to be in a health career that's going to make a difference because for me that's really kind of where, you know, it comes from here. And so there are um, a lot of challenges working at the tribal level and when you say research in Indian country, on the reservation, everybody, all the, all the relatives want to run. And our people, you know, historically have had a lot of negative connotations with that. So it was kind of a challenge when I came into this position. So one of the very first things that, that um, I had to do was kind of research what had been done to that point. And the lady that had started when I came on board had, had uh, transitioned into the tribal chairman's position. So she had been in there a few months, but she did get a lot of stuff that was really kind of critical and important. One of them was our research code. And <coughs> when I first came back to my reservation and I was on the college board of trustees, that was one of the very first things I kept asking about. And I kept asking for, for five and a half years is, is where's our IRB, where's our IRB, where's our IRB? And it just was never forthcoming. So back in 2013, we, as a tribal council at that time, I was on council, we had that opportunity to approve that. And it passed by resolution and it went under the Department of Tribal Education under the direction of Dr. Sherry Johnson, who is sitting right over there. Sherry, wave. <laughs> so she's been, she's been really a driving force in this effort. So um, while she began that process, there was uh, also the IRB that was established along with that. Within our tribe, we have seven districts, and we have our legal codes, and we have our DCA, which is our District Chairman's Association. Then we have reservation-wide meetings that all this information has to go out to. And then we have our Tribal Council, who ultimately gives a stamp of approval. So. The initial drafts, and it's gone through many drafts for our research code, has kind of been through a long process. And when I came on board, it kind of had kind of come to a standstill because the one person transitioned out and then I transitioned in, so there was kind of a learning curve on my part. But and then a couple of weeks into my job, then I broke my arm. So if you can imagine trying to, you know, sit there and type with one finger, um, that was kind of a challenge. But I was able to pick up a lot of the information that had already been developed. So we kind of, kind of went fast track then. We looked at a lot of community building, going to our judicial committee and our THIPO, which is our Tribal Historic Preservation Office. And there was, seemed to be a lot of resistance to our research code, so I had to go really and speak one-on-one -on -one to our community members, to our key people in our community in order to gain support for this research code that we wanted to get passed. So there was, you know, hours spent doing that and trying to educate people, and we finally, finally, 
in a matter of about three weeks scheduled all seven districts in May and we presented the research code to them. And that was one of our, one of my goals was to, we need to get this code passed. You know, it's like, okay, we're gonna do this now. So we, with Sherry and I, we ended up going to the seven districts and presenting that. There's still a little bit of a process to it, but the next step will be the reservation-wide <coughs> meeting that we will be doing. <coughs> While we've been doing all of this kind of on the side, then we've, we've also had the IRB board, the local research review board, what we call it, already in place. So when I came on in January, they were already meeting. And we have had projects that have come through and we've had projects that have been approved and we've also developed research permits. Along with this process is the development of our policies and procedures, the bylaws, you know, and then the code is still in there. And let me back up a little bit. Before the research review board was in place, our research projects came before the human services board. And when the human services board reviewed the information, then they would basically make a recommendation of, you know, they approve it or not approve it. And then that would go on to tribal council. Well, I'm sure you know many of you are very familiar with the research project and the amount of paper and the amount of reading that has to be done with that. So the once the review board was developed and the IRB was developed, then that kind of, that human service board function uh, transferred to the research review board. So we basically been handling all the projects. So I'm anticipating that the code could be passed in August or possibly September, hopefully at the latest, which would be about a year's time from the start of drafting that code. And we're pretty, I'm pretty confident about the passage of that. It's just gonna take a few more meetings and I know that it should be you know, forthcoming because I think we've kind of gone through the hardest part of it. The other thing that we've been working on and I've been working with the Regulatory Knowledge Corps with Jyoti and Tamana is our electronic submission of our application for human subjects research. And we had a paper form that I would just email it to people and then they would have to sub fill, that, fill that out and then send it back and then they'd have to send all the appropriate documentation. And through that process, we were able to fine tune that and then in conjunction with that process, I've been having to get training on, in the Axiom Mentor Program. And in that program, I've actually put the SWO application for human subject research form in that program. So what I will be doing then is sending out, we'll just say a researcher approaches a tribe, they will get access, they'll get a password to that. And then this program will give them the ask all the questions that we have on that paper form and then it will automatically go out to each review board member it will also keep track of your agenda it'll even do your minutes it'll it'll save your data it'll do everything and we've actually with Tamana was able to finish that just this past, just this past week actually. So I was 
so excited. I just was like jumping up and screaming on the phone with Tamana. And I just felt like, like the biggest nerd ever, you know, like, wow, we did this. And only you guys would probably understand. <laughs> no, everybody else would look at me like, what? So that was one cool thing. The final, I guess, things that I would like to leave the, the um, conference with is just that with all the tribal infrastructure stuff that we have to develop and are still in the process of developing, I know that it's real important for me as being the research specialist to try to be able to let the younger people know why this is important. And there's kind of a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that actually went into this. And, you know, in my, um, in my, uh, I, I can't remember if I put this picture, whoops. Put this picture here. I don't know if you could see it. Maybe some of you have seen this picture before, but that's actually a scalp, little pro scalp, that was in the Mayo Brothers in Rochester in their clinic in their office. And so, a lot of our people have been affected by research and. Uh, a lot of real negative ways and so it's real important that as tribal members that we educate our community members and educate our young people and I believe that by growing our own researchers within our community that that's the only way that you know we're gonna close that gap in those health disparities so thank you <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Anita Frederick, and I'm from the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians, and I um, work for the Tribal Nations Research Group. We're a nonprofit organization out of uh, that's a uh, tribal organization. So we're chartered actually through our tribe. And um, I also want to mention that I have with, at the conference with us is one of our councilmen, which I'm really excited that he came. Uh, Mr. Lauren Jay, he's actually my district council, so that's even better, right? And then also Stephanie Jay, who, yeah, you put the names together, they're husband and wife, but Stephanie works with our tribal health department. So I'm really glad that they got to see our world because Stephanie is also on our research review board and um, our community advisory board. So um, they get to get in the, the you know, down in the in the nitty gritty of it all a little bit more than just hearing me say we should do this and we should do that and we should do this so I'm excited about that um, really quick I'm gonna try to be quick because I know you guys are looking at me like wow okay this is just I wanted to provide like a little timeline of where we've been since we we started back in um, March of 2013 and this was before me this was the Tribal Nations Research Group, which it was um, at the time just a, a board of three members who had this idea and presented it to the Tribal Council. And that was back um, in uh, 2013, and I say February 15, but it's actually March 2013. Um, and they talked with the Tribal Government on how this should be organized, what's the goals going to be of this organization, and how are we going to carry out those goals. Um, and I think, fortunately, Paula um, Mort Carter, who is one of my board of directors and also works at UND, kind of had some insight to the Kirka project and was able to apply for the grant. And they were funded with that a grant um, in, mm, I think, August of 2014, 13. Um, they solicited applications, and that's when um, they didn't get any applications. So <laughs> they actually. Um, reached out to me and asked me if it was something I would be interested in doing. 
I had been at the tribal college for 18 years and numerous capacities there is financial aid, registrar, institutional research, institutional effectiveness, dean. So um, it was hard to make that move from my very stable job with a very good benefit package <laughs> to a nonprofit organization that still didn't have 501c3 status. But you know what, sometimes you just take a leap of faith and you do what you think is really needed within your community. And I was excited to be working with this group. Um, so I did it and here we are today, um, a, a whole lot long longer, uh, a whole long longer down the line. Um, so a little bit of things that have happened, we've established a few partnerships along the way and I can't see right here, that's why I'm looking up there. I need bifocals. Um, but anyway, we received the Kirka project and with that we've built some infrastructure within our community which we're really excited about. Um, along the way, we've received a few other opportunities, um, one through our local Pathways to Prosperity program, which basically established us as our data center for the tribe. So now we've got two goals met. One, the, the research infrastructure. Two, the data collection and data storage and um, how we're going to build this data repository data center for our tribe. The next thing that we did was we, um, I should say, I, I <laughs> went through that horrible application by the IRS um, to seek 501c3 status. And to this day, I just don't even know how we did it. I just went through it line by line and just made sure if I was supposed to answer a question, I answered it um, as thoroughly as I possibly could. In January of 2015, this year, we actually did receive our 501c3 nonprofit status, which I was really shocked because I got this letter and they said, in it, you know, usually you have all these items you have to do. And there was one item and it says, just sign this form and send it back. So I called the program officer at IRS and he actually answered the phone. And he's like, nope, your application was perfect. Everything's in order. All I need you to do is say you accept all the policies. And I was like, really? It's that easy? And he goes, well, it's not normally this easy. You just had a really good application. I'm like, yes, I should be a lawyer. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm like, really, they pay people. We looked actually to hire somebody to do this. And it was like $5,000. And I'm like, you come from a tribal community. You just try to do your best with what you can. And that's what we did. I said, well, we'll try it one time on our own. And if it doesn't go through, then we'll hire somebody. And it did. So I'm so excited about that. Um, we actually have an official research review board now, thanks to Tamana and Joy T and their guidance through that whole process. And uh, we've had a few training meetings, no official meetings yet. Um, they actually got one of Dr. Best's study to play around with a little bit. And uh, they have a test coming up next month. So we actually approved this study. We're not making them wait, you know, for, for the decisions, but it was a pretty, good study for us to review, so um, we used it kind of as a test study for our research review board, which is exciting. Um, and most recently, um, just in the last couple weeks, we actually, well, let's back up a little bit. We actually were also um, featured on the, on, in an internal publication at NIM HD, so we were excited about that. So there's a little article done about Tribal Nations Research Group and the work we've done. And um, that was really exciting, you know, and I brought it to the council meeting and I told them, look at, look at, we're in the limelight, you know, guys. And, and they're all like, what is she talking about? You know, this woman's crazy. But no, for real, they were really proud and, and um, it showed the really good collaboration that, you know, the, our tribal council with Sanford and also with Tribal Nations Research Group. So we were excited about that. And then the next big news we have is that we were recently selected as one of the Bush Foundation Community Innovation Projects, which is huge for us as an organization and a tribe. And um, we hope that we can help other communities do some of the same things that we're doing also, you know, with the 501c3 and just any way we can really assist them. And a big component of that is some items that are missing within our community, which is like an economic impact study um, some uh, community assessments. You know, we have the health assessment covered with some of the Sanford dollars, and we have another component of um, some of the data gathering that needs to take place with some of the P2P money. So now we're just gonna build it and say this is, you know, get some staff on board that could actually just 
design everything and put it all together in one big we say happy family because it all matters you know the health the environment all of those matter so that's kind of what we're doing with some of the bush foundation money and besides the money i mean they could give you fifty thousand dollars and it would be great what the bush foundation does for you is it they are the best marketers there ever was on earth i mean they they just roll out all this stuff and you're involved in this and they you know connections are really good same with like the sanford you know, connections are key there sometimes, and sometimes you can have the smallest pot of money, but then you meet all these people who can help fund you in other ways. So really, this small amount of money that you received turned into this huge pool of money. And that's kind of what happened with Sanford, you know. We got our, our um, award from them, but with that, we've been able to network and do additional things, which is just, I think, great. Um, how has Kirka helped? Well, Kirka... <laughs> You know, sometimes we just have these conversations, especially me and Emily. We just like, it's like, well, what about this? Well, well, what do you think about this? Well, should we do this? Or, you know, what makes us different if we do this? So those are kind of some of the conversations that we've had with admin, with Emily. You know, Anne-Marie is just like, I'm always like bugging her. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but can you help me with this? And she's like, you're not a botheration in you. You know, but you always feel like you are. And then Joy P and Tawana has just been amazing. And... I have to tell you, Chad and Susan and Wyatt have been the most patient with me because <laughs> sometimes I don't talk to them for a month, but they're still waiting on that call for me and I feel so bad because Thursdays I figured out are like one of the worst days for me to have a meeting now. So we're, re we're, we're changing that. We've, we've, we've evaluated the, the, <laughs> the, the, the idea and it's not working. So, you know, just, um, I also want to say Jana Prasik. You know, the work they done in C prior to them in that whole changeover, they just did some really, really good work. The modules that they had put out were amazing, and um, I was excited to use them. So hopefully we still get an opportunity to use some of that work. So, you know, it's just all the cores, Victoria and um, Jen, and I believe Jessica is the new one. They've just been all amazing, and it's just been like, you know, kind of just back and forth stuff. That's what we are, we're sounding boards to each other. So, well, 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 did this work? No, well, okay, then maybe you want to try this. And they're kind of, Victoria's kind of the one who said, yeah, your community advisory board is just not working for you. Let's, let's try something different. Maybe let's just take a break from it. Let's just step back for a while. Um, so now we have an idea, we have a focus, we kind of know what we want to do with that. So let's get back out into the community and do some work there. You can't do it all at once, and I think that's what we were trying to do. Too many things all at once. Some of our future goals, and again, it's always sustainability. How are we going to sustain this in the future? A lot of the um, review boards are actually entities of the tribe. Although ours is two were parallel, our research review board and the research process is owned by our tribe. We've just been given the task to manage it for them and oversee the process and get it done and try to keep politics and all of that good stuff out of the process. Um, so sustainability is always going to be at the forefront. You know, we have a strategic plan in place. We say this is where our next step will be. Hopefully we can get there. We can find the funding to do it. Um, and it's always just to support research in any capacity we can. It's to speak to students. Um, it's to speak to like health boards and IHS and the high schools and the college and um, just the community in general. Um, other universities about the research project process at Turtle Mountain. Um, you know, with when you manage the IRB, it's either you're loved or you're hated. There's no in between with people. You know, it's like, oh, they're making me do another form. Geez, I have to do another report. Really, I have to put all that data in one format. That's the mentality that comes back to us. And it's like, well, yeah. Then you have the people over here who, like Stephanie, is on a health you know, committee, and she likes to see the results. And it's like, oh, yeah, you got some new data, and they are the council. So like I said, there's no happy medium. It's either they hate us or they love us. So, um, You know, we really want our data center established and used by our community and our community of researchers. We really want to build that internal capacity, that, that organizational capacity within our tribe um, as a community of researchers because that's so, so important. I'm not going to say that, our, that we've been 
used in research because I have not seen any real evidence of that within our community. But what has happened is we went back and looked for research projects back to 1990, and I think we found 72. You take 72 divided by how many years that's been, 25 years? So maybe five, two, three research projects a year. Since we started this process in January of 2014, we're on our 20, 23rd protocol review. So there was research going on and we weren't aware of it. We weren't credited for it. A lot of times our com community wasn't even mentioned in the research because there's no way suddenly we have 23 protocols in a year and a half. The research had to have been going on prior to and you know, it's like random research, you know, but that's, you know, it, it's, it's there. So now we have hopefully some control of it and um, all that good stuff. Um, and then a big thing that I'm working with Stephanie on is trying to get a tribal-wide data management software in place. Um, so like a case management type software, data is so sporadic within our community. Tribal diabetes will be saying this, and maternal health will be saying this, and IHS says this. So, okay, what's the real number? What number do, we, do I use? So if we have a try to, we're trying to develop this tribal data management system where everybody will be linked, referrals will be made, programs will be a bit more um, productive, and programs that aren't meeting their, the needs of the community you know, can possibly be, um, those resources can be allocated where we, uh, there's a higher need. So I think, and with, with the help of Tribal Health Administration, we'll, we'll get that going over the next year, and it's real, that's a really exciting part of it, because then when the council says, Anita, we have, I'm going to D.C. today, can you tell me, you know, we're meeting with Health and Human Services and all these programs, can you give me all the information that I could get um, on, like, you know, incarcerations and why were they incarcerated and, you know, pregnancies and how many mothers tested positive for, um, you know, drugs and things like that when the babies were born and, you know, how many of our youth are in um, centers off the reservation for juvenile detention and all those good things and they have the data. The data is going to drive the decision and the data is going to drive the decision to give tribal, you know, Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa money to support some of those programs. So that's where we're at. And then our active advisory council that I think is so key to everything. So and if you want to learn more about us, and if I click on this, I hope I don't mess everybody up. Um, but here's kind of where, uh, that's not me. Oh, there we are. We actually have a very active web page. Um, I'm the manager of our website, so I updated as often as I could actually get to it. But our mission, our purpose, everything's there. And uh, we actually have a job opening. So if anybody is interested in coming to work with me, just know we work really, really, really hard and a lot of long hours. So, and I don't compensate too much. <laughs> but here, you know, that's kind of one other really quick thing is um, I think is key is we're bringing back members from home virtually through our associate membership. There's no, you know, like no cost to join us, but we have members from around the country. I'm sure you recognize some of these, Dwayne. Um, and these are just a few. I haven't added about 12 more that I got over the last week. Since we got the Bush Innovation Grant, everybody wants part of it. So, uh, I mean, you know, wants to, they've seen it, that the, our um, website's out there. So I had 12 more in the last week, but Dr. Dwayne Champagne, Dr. Denise Lajmadir, Dr. Jessica Metcalf, I don't know if you recognize her with Beyond Bus, since she's my niece, by the way. <laughs> um, Melvin Manette, um, big boy. Okay, I gotta go. So that's me. Thank you. <laughs> How do you follow that act? <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Bonita Morn. I am the community research liaison at Chandeska Chikana Community College. I've been in that capacity since October of 2014. 
Um, I think I really kept to the slides that Emily sent or asked us to limit to. So this is going to be short and sweet and I hope to the point. <laughs> Research. Research at Spirit Lake. How has it been done in the past? What is being currently done? And what are we proposing to do in the future? When I started in October of 2014, I had to do some exploring and looking at what had been done previously. And I don't know if you can see these slides fairly well, but the, the general um, rule of thumb was everything was brought to the tribal council, literally everything. Um, a proposal, um, and I'm not sure if it how it was presented to them or if it was even presented to them or not. Sometimes it was in the format of a letter asking, bring in a letter of support or even a template or a letter <coughs> format and asking the, the council to uh, do it on their letterhead and sign it and send it to them. So that was the process previously. And when I began in October of 2014, like I said, I started looking at what, what had uh, taken place prior to that and then moving on forward, um, Chandeska Chicana Community College um, picked up the ball because they went ahead and um, put together a resolution. And basically what the resolution was, was to um, request the council's approval where they could review um, documents such as manuscripts, reports, publications, and make recommendations to the tribal council for approval. So that was the process, that process continued, and then we came upon Kirka, which has been a, a real um, eye-opener, at least on my part as a tribal member, um, looking at the research infrastructure at the tribe and what, what has happened in the past, where we're at, what, where we were at in 2011, where we went in 2013. Um, um, Dr. McDonald was um, the vice president at Chandeska when he picked up the 2011 resolution and went, kept, went with that. And then in 2013, during his chairmanship for the Spirit Lake Tribe, there was another resolution approved in 2013 where that uh, review and approval process went directly through the review board. It didn't have to go to the council anymore for approval. So that process continued again, and now where we're at in 2014, we drafted a, a, a resolution um, to the tribal council, and what that resolution specifically stated was, it was giving the, designating Chandeska Chicana Community College the administrative authority to op operate a regular, regulatory research infrastructure on behalf of the Spirit Lake tribe. And so that process was approved by the council. We've been continuing on with that, moving forward. Um, I went ahead with the help of some of the information that the tribal partners submitted to me in regard to the research code. I went ahead and drafted a research code for the Spirit Lake tribe. It went into final edit in March and it's been sitting on the tribal council's desk for review and approval. So. The Spirit Lake Tribe will hopefully have that document, I hope, by the end of July, review and approved. Other documents that has been done is there's policies and procedures that have been drafted. I had assistance from the regulatory knowledge group writing those up. Um, there's uh, forms that have been put together. We've gotten the mentor IRB in place. We've looked at some past research that has been entered on the system. It, it, it's moving along. I, I, actually, I'm surprised at how, kind of how fast-paced we, we've gotten ahead. Um, my, my thoughts in regard to that is how are we going to continue to move forward the sustainability of the project in general, looking at it from the perspective of the tribe. Um, one of the things that have, I've been talking with the Community Advisory Board for the Spirit Lake Tribe is possibly looking at having to charge an administrative fee when research projects are um, applied for through the Spirit Lake Tribe to help maintain that. But that's just a thought right now. 
as we all know, the body is re the research review board is the body that's going to be responsible and review all research, not just human subjects, all research on behalf of the Spirit Lake Tribe. It's going to be a tribally driven research board with authority overall. Purpose, protection of human subjects, animals, cultural resources in our community. Ensure that research is conducted ethically and legally. And based mainly, we want to make sure that when somebody's proposing a research project within our tribal community, that the benefit is more significant and a higher priority than any risk at all to the community. And the mission of the RRB would be to positively, positively contribute to educational and scholarly activities within the community that benefit our tribe. I have a question for the, for the crowd. Does anyone know who Jack Andreka is? Anyone? I was reading an article when I was traveling down to Rapid City on um, the other morning and um, I came upon an article in a magazine that I found on the airplane that I was writing. And it's about a 15 year old boy, 15 years old, who stumbled, he liked to do research, he liked to look around at different things. And he stumbled upon the most significant research project related to cancer in our country. And there's a protein on that is derived from a certain thing that he does that brings out, I think it's called mesothelin. And he's, he won a $75,000 scholarship from that discovery. And so now it's being looking, looked at more clinically from a clinical perspective and there are clinical trials that are gonna be tested. So I believe it was Don that mentioned, we want our young kids to be involved. What a better way than to bring something that to the forefront than let them see that, let them feel it, let them hear that. So just Google his name. It's all over the internet. And to me, research is part of a circle. It starts. What is the benefit? What is the primary benefit going to be to our tribe? How is, it going to, how is it going to evolve through that circle of time? And it's going to be continuous. It's going to help our tribes. It's going to benefit our tribes. It's going to grow. It's going to be our future. So we always have to look at that. We always have to be watching that. And I changed that. What, is it, what are we going to benefit as tribal people? It's going to build our skills, it's going to build a, upon our abilities, and it's going to build upon our knowledge. Thank you.